Hey, hey there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back. It's another Red Pill Religion Podcast, where amongst the things we say is that if a majority of non-Catholics believe something, and Catholics also believe it, is that not a sign that it is worthy of respect, at least, as actual Christian belief? Please, if you like the kind of content we do here on Red Pill Religion, check us out on redpillreligion.com. In these days of social media censorship, you never know when we may disappear. We've had three channels appear, disappear underneath us from uh, har- uh, harassment, and we're thinking about investing in a podcast neighbor, uh, network. But if you miss us, please find us on redpillreligion.com. Hit the tip jars. Buy some of the merchandise. That's where you'll find us if we disappear. Also speaking, I'm just going to put out a brief shout-out to Peace and Mark uh a social justice leftist, uh, obvious atheist too, a guy named uh, Vouch. This channel just got struck with a phony copyright strike by a guy named Vouch. Uh, fortunately, YouTube did not did not suspend the channel, but it was but it was still a phony uh, phony copyright strike. It was complete fair use on a foolish progressive who first declared uh, that. Uh, uh, and this was in an argument with uh, Dave, the distributist, and uh, on YouTube. And he, he he loudly declared that if you were not a progressive, you had a problem with black people, the people of <laughs> color and minorities, and were probably basically a racist if you were not a progressive. Um, and then, you know, when Dave, the distributist, uh, got a little annoyed by this, uh, he... he, he Literally on this video, which we have now uploaded to VidShoot because it is no longer available on YouTube. They took it down. But if you check the links in the low, the low bar to the, the YouTube video, we're teasing him. But we say, crypto fastest progressive vouch false struck this. He accidentally admitted to being a racist. Because in this same exchange with Dave the Distributist, this was so precious. He said, as a progressive, he has absolutely no racism of any kind whatsoever. And then Dave the Distributist uh Quoted from a recent book that was a New York Times that was reviewed by the New York Times, which which stated that and was written by a progressive professor that said, stated that any white person who said they were not racist was definitionally racist, and so Vouch had to admit that there was a problem with his reasoning because he had just claimed not to be a racist. So, in reality, Mr. Vouch, a progressive ideologue, has just admitted he is a horrible racist in our book. And he got that he got that taken down because he said it was a copyright strike because we were quoting his video. Isn't it amazing that YouTube even went along with that? Anyway, go check it out on uh, go check it out on BitChute. The link is in the low bar. We'll have it on the blog. Vouch, you're 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 a disgusting idiot. You're obviously no better than Hitler as a progressive because you said you're not a racist. That means you're at least as bad as Hitler. I think it means he's at least he's at least as bad as Hitler, don't you, John? It means that. Uh, it means that the progressivism is not a political philosophy. It is a religion. It is a religion that has certain mysteries of the faith that cannot be understood by outsiders. One of those mysteries is that any accusation you make against an enemy is valid, but even if you do the thing yourself that you're accusing others of, it is not valid when, when applied to you. That's just one of the rules of their, of their uh, method. Literally, as a proud progressive, he declared he is not racist in any way of whatsoever, and that if you're a conservative, you're racist. Um, and then, when quoted that book, he just turned into a stammer because literally, a progressive professor, because this is you know this is the way progressives yeah. are, just glowingly reviewed well, the, the New York Times that, that I mean, said the professor you know that was praising the professor for saying that any white person who denied being a racist was clearly a part of the racial problem and a well, racist. The professor, the professor appreciates his Kafka. In in a Kafka short story, when you're accused of a crime, denying the accusation is proof of guilt. Yeah. So so the 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 mystery of the progressive religion is that any accusation, even two accusations that contradict each other, if issued against a, an enemy, a conservative, are always valid. And uh, if they happen to apply to you for some reason, that's not valid. That is why he was able to stammer like an idiot, and yet still have the gall to attack your channel under false pretenses. Because in his mind, you were still an enemy. You were still guilty. So, I, uh, I I will just... I, mean, I, don't know, I don't know which is worse. The professor's uh, obvious uh, heads I win, tails you lose approach to not defining his terms. I can't believe this guy's a professor of anything. Or, or the 
the or the uh, the poor lost uh, sheep of the flock of the uh, Church of uh, Moloch there, who who uh, has been bewildered by his own leadership. He doesn't understand the rule. The, the rule is that the rule is that your that uh, progressives is pure hypocrisy. And, and uh, I, YouTube, the reason why they only apply rules against uh, conservatives and against religious people, and never apply the same rules against, you know, Hamas or uh, <laughs> anyone else doing anything on YouTube, uh, is because that's part of their part of their religious part of their faith. They're engaged in the holy crusade. We're just going to say here from now on on Red Felt Religion that Roush is very obviously a self-admitted proud racist, and we 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 think he is a, he is literally worse than Hitler. That 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 is our that is our educated opinion. He is literally he is literally worse than the Klansman because after all, he denied being a well, racist. That's uh, all you need to prove. Literally Hitler, literally Hitler. That's all I'm saying. Literally. Well, Hitler. I, I live in the Commonwealth of Virginia, and our uh, Democrat elected governor, assistant governor, and uh, attorney general have either been accused of rape or have been found in pictures in blackface or in uh, Klansman hoods uh, dressed Sir, up for Halloween or something. Do you not understand the and, oppressives? That's okay. And I do understand. Because the first rule of their of the, the first mystery of their religion, the first mystery of our religion is the Eucharist. The first mystery of their religion is hypocrisy. <laughs> so standards exist only to be used as weapons against enemies. All if right. If the Democrat himself, if the progressive himself is doing the self-same behavior, it is forgiven. Because right. their their gods, uh, Moloch and uh, uh, Lucifer and uh, Lilith and the other gods they, they bow to, uh, Mammon, uh, they're as forgiving as, as ours is, but just for different for different reasons. All right. I think we've gone off long enough on it, but uh, we are agreed then the consensus of, of, of everybody present is the man is literally Hitler. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> and when I say literally, I mean figuratively, because, of course, that's another mystery of their religion. They don't know what words mean. We, you and I have to use English or maybe even Latin to talk to each other, but they use a, la a, a language that sounds like English, but none of the words match up to any reality as we understand it. You know? <laughs> so anyway, there's, just so everybody knows, traditionally John C. Wright and I have always been on Wednesdays. For the last several months, we've been on Monday nights because uh, I had the family commitment thing. Family commitment stuff is done, so it's all cool, and we're back on Wednesdays, which we kind of like better anyway. Please, everybody, this is the introduction to John C. Wright. Please go visit his blog, SciFiWright.com. I see that he's got a signal boost up for St. Tommy NYPD. That is our friend Declan, uh, Declan Finn. Great series. I'm proud to help him boost his signal. That's a, it's a great series. My uh, beautiful and talented wife had the, had the privilege of helping him to uh, edit it. She was the editor for that. So we've got the we've got the we've got the booster for that. We got a booster for here where we're going to be talking about my favorite topic, uh, the Virgin Mary, and we hey. also have a new chapter of Lost on the Last Continent. But, but no comments. Ugh. No comments on what? Lost on well, the last no, no one's no one's. I see that no one's left to comment on my exciting episode eighty three. Of course, it's ridiculous to ask fans to make a comment on every single chapter of a 105 chapter uh, uh, epic. But still, but still, I uh, I realize I realize the immediacy. It's not like in the old days. Right now, I can write a story and I can get immediate feed feedback from people. That's just really good. That's really cool. I uh, I'm, I want to remind everybody that that Lost on the Last Continent is a sample, a free sample of which there's been 83 published so far. Click on the works link on his blog, scifiwrite.com, and you can see his professionally published stuff, award-nominated and award-winning stuff. He mentioned his wife, the editor. That would be El Jaji Lamplighter, who is a fine writer and a professional editor herself. So links to that are in the low bar with other things from the, the night. Now, to, uh, to get back to where we started, I we are going to be talking about the Virgin Mary tonight. And there, you would think that there is no topic that is more divisive among Christians, but in point of fact, it's not so. This divisiveness is mostly an American thing, or it's mostly a split between certain types of, I guess you'd call Bible-only Christians, or I call them Bible Christians, um, that, you know, just are 
hypersola scriptura and they see, you know, if something's not spelled out in plain black and white for them, they don't believe it. In fact, they'll even say, show me that or I won't believe it. Show me that in the Bible or I don't believe it. The problem is, is that type of Christian, while they are common in, in the English speaking world and some other places, are, are really not that common elsewhere. I have a chart here somewhere um, uh, that kind of shows what the major branches of Christianity are. And there are certain beliefs that are common to virtually all the branches that we have here. See how now we have Restorationism, Anabaptism, Protestantism generally, Anglicanism, the Western and Eastern Rite or, uh, Catholics, the Eastern Orthodoxy, the Oriental Orthodoxy, and the Syrian Orthodox. Now, when it comes to the Virgin Mary, there's certain things that are actually common to the vast majority of all these groups. Not all of them, but the vast majority of them. One, and it's the one you kind of have to start with is to understand the role of the Virgin Mary is um, intercessory prayers for the saints. And if you don't understand interc intercessory prayers to the saints, then much of the rest of it is harder to understand. And there's a certain percentage of Christians, I grew up among them, I grew up with them, who just said that is pagan, that is necromancy, that is... That doesn't work and that's not biblical. So that um, if you ask a saint to pray to you that that's wrong. That is a very small minority of Christians who believe this and it's always been a small minority. We can show that Christians have been doing this for 2000 years and it's not necromancy and it's not un unbiblical. I'm never sure what to tell somebody uh, who claims that we're not allowed to ask for prayers from the saints, but, but they can't show me in the Bible where I'm not allowed to do that. To, to use their own rules. I'm in not fact, sure what else to say a about passage, it. Huh? There's a passage in the Bible where uh, St. Paul asks us to pray for each other. And the oh. saint is still a member of the church. He's still a member of the, of the mystical body of Christ. So it, how is asking St. Justin, my, my namesake, to pray for me any different from asking my local pastor or, or, the, guy, or the, uh, the, 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 the unit chaplain to pray for me? If you look at a good book to look at on this, I mean, I don't know, the, the type of Christian, I'll call them Bible Christians who say, show me that in the Bible, I find are people who genuinely are always looking for a fight. Because whatever doctrine they, and they'll even sometimes say we have no doctrines or dogmas, but that's just foolishness. A doctrine is a teaching. And a dogma is something which you hold to be incontrovertibly true. If you are a Bible-believing Bible Christian, you have doctrines and dogmas. The only question is, which ones do you recognize yourself as having? Usually, I hate to say it, I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to scandalize our, our Protestant brethren, but usually the Bible-believing Christians who make that argument fail to mention that the parts of the Bible that they ripped out of the Bible and threw away have things like intercessory prayers for the dead, which, which go back to Jewish times. It's in Second Maccabees, for example. Yeah, we know that the Jews before we know so, that the Jews before Christ were praying to the dead in heaven. Yeah, it was all, it was already happening. So logically, you can't both say this group of books and only this group of books is the divine word of Christ, based on of God, uh, based on the authority of a church I regard as apostate, and, and then say, but I get to edit based on my own personal beliefs. I get to edit what goes in and, and doesn't go into that to that book, the holy book defined by God as being the complete teachings of the, of the Christian world. Just about everything we're going to say here tonight, you can put out, pull out of even the, 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 the flawed, in, in, in my, our opinion, King James, even though I don't think the 66 book canon is sufficient. And I think that King James has some flaws, but you can prove most of this using that. Um, uh, you know, the, how you summon demons and otherworldly spirits and how you pray asking someone in heaven to pray for you is different. Expecting the Bible to clearly say something on this when it's, it, there's all kinds of Christian doctrines, you know, the right. Trinity, the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Eucharist, these are believed by the vast majority of Christians too. You don't find them spelled out clearly in scripture, but they are fully supported by scripture. You just have to know how to read them. Yep. And I hate to say it, Scripture does not interpret itself. No. It I mean, it, 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 because the people who wrote that book, the people who put it together, were not intending the book to be read outside of the context of the church that was writing the book and putting it together. 
They already knew what yeah. they believed. And even when you go to the parts of the New Testament where they say, you know, you can trust scripture, we rely on scripture, or you will find some of the early Christians saying, we rely on scripture for our sources, not external sources, which you heard, if you, if you see some yeah. of the, the church fathers say in the second and third centuries. But when they were saying that, there was no New Testament that was officially recognized by everybody. It didn't exist. The New Testament wasn't scripture yet. When, when a lot of that was going down. The, the well, Bible was put together by men who already knew what they believed and had passed down the faith, the traditions, both by word of mouth and by letter. One of the, the things, Bible, which is in the scriptures. Right, and, 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 that's, and that's the deposit of faith. That's the, the verbal, the living tradition within the church. One thing that made it impossible for me when I converted from atheism to Christianity, but did not know which de denomination to go to, to go to a denomination that was sola scriptura, that was Bible only, was the fact that all of them that I that I knew, I'm, I'm not speaking of all of them now, I'm just the ones I encountered, they all believed in things like the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity, the soteriology, and the incarnation, and other doctrines that are not specifically spelled out clearly in the Bible, but they are hinted at, they're, they, they are supported from the, from the Bible, though they're not, they're not, you know, explicitly said. But all these people believed wanted to reject certain beliefs, such as intercessory prayer to saints, such as the eternal virginity of Mary, such as the... Uh, uh, the Eucharist the itself, in many the Eucharist, cases. The real presence of the Eucharist. Yep. And all those doctrines are actually older than the 5th century, which is the cutoff date for establishing the canon of the Bible. Yep. So the Bible itself was not officially codified, was not for real, was not the Bible, until that date. So if you use the Bible to reject any doctrines, logically you can only use it to reject doctrines after that date. Anything older than that has more authority than the, if, if the church was apostate in the fourth century, then it could not in the fifth century be trusted to identify the scripture correctly. Right. If it was apostate in the third century, then the, its fourth century rulings can't be trusted, but its second century rulings can be trusted, right? So yeah. if, if you see the eternal virginity of Mary uh, attested to in an anti-Nicene father, then that is Christianity. Yeah, That's legitimate. Right so, right and so just to explain, I, I, we can cite Bible verse after Bible verse, but although I find that citing Bible verses invites certain Bible Christians to think that this is an immediate debate. And, they, you know, if I cite a Bible verse, they start flinging other Bible verses back like this is a war, like we're, we're, we're using Bible verses as spells to fling at each other. That's a tradition yeah. of Christianity that helped make me an atheist. It really did. I grew up in it and I despise everything about it. I, oh, I'll have, the, I'll have the Bible verse handy and I'll just literally I've seen people do arguments like they're totally spell casting Deuteronomy 2039 John 316 you know Ephesians 4 17 I win it's I also as a trained lawyer solemnly assure you that no human mind even with the power and assistance of the Holy Spirit can translate a document without looking into the surrounding context of the other documents written at the time and what they mean and what they've always been interpreted to mean. Yeah, you don't get to just say, I get to open the Bible and interpret it myself. Yeah, I mean, can, you imagine, can, you imagine interpreting the, can you imagine interpreting the Constitution that way? If you yeah. said, okay, this is a, uh, impeachment is for high crimes and misdemeanors, and I will make up what those words mean. Not, I will not look at the English common law tradition going back to the 12th century. Uh, I, I will not look at any of the previous Supreme Court cases. I will not look at the uh, at, at the writings of the uh, of the uh, of the founding fathers and what they said about what what they thought the the guys who wrote it, I won't look at their wording to see what it you know it, it, the Federalist Papers. I won't read, I wrote I wrote read Madison Jay and Hamilton to see what the uh, people who helped put the uh, thing together meant. That's that's insane. <laughs> that's that's insane. And you can't uh, as much as I respect uh, you know saying plain things in plain English or Greek or Aramaic or Latin or or, or uh, whatever. Uh, if you're trying to interpret a doctor, a document, not in its original language, you have to, you have to have some expertise in, in the document, in in the, in the act of interpreting and how to interpret it. Uh, no, we're you're going to at that point. You we're know, you can't stop off base, but yeah, the point is made, guys. But I'm, I'm saying this defensively because all the things that are said against Mary, if they were in the Bible, no one would object. The only people who are objecting are the things that are in the tradition, but not in the Bible. I'm trying to show that the Bible-only approach 
doesn't even make sense on its own on its own basis. But let's, so just, let's make it real clear. It's fully supported by the Bible. It's fully compatible with the Bible. It's I mean, I can get into, you know, in Galatians where it says we're we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses and revelation. And Paul says we're seeing intercessor intercession and prayers for each other constantly. We see in Revelations how uh, the prayers of the saints are received by God as sweet incense. We see in Maccabees and other things. It's it's pervasive practice. And when we look at the artwork and the other yeah. history we have from the era, we know that Christians have always been doing intercessory prayers. So on this one, I, you know, the only answer I hear uh, from from the Bible Christians is. You know, uh, truth isn't isn't by majority consensus. Well, the one thing I would say is that Christ did say that he would stay with us to the end and and that the Holy Spirit is, Spirit would lead to Christians. So you either believe your minority tradition of Christians are the true Christians who get it right. And Christ allowed the vast majority of other Christians to get questions like this wrong for 2000 years. Because I'm going to look at this chart here now. And when it comes to intercessory prayers from the saints, let me see if I can bring that same chart up again. When it comes to intercessory prayers from the, sa uh, the saints, you had it, but you lost. There it is. I have it again. And uh, we have, of course, the Roman Catholics. We also have going all the way back to the 400s, the, the Assyrian Church of the East, which at one time was the largest branch of Christianity in the world, many believe, and has been martyred that much over the last 2,000 years. They still survive. And by the way, I may get to this summer interview a bishop from their tradition. Uh, they go back to the 400s. They affirm they're sometimes uh, called the Nestorians, but I can, I'll just, the brief thing on them is the Nestorian controversy is resolved and Nestor was a misunderstood. Most people believe that now. And in any case, they're thoroughly Trinitarian and they love the blessed Theo. Uh, they call her Christokos because they don't like the phrase mother of God, but they only don't like it because in the Aramaic language that they use, mother of God sounds like mother of the father and it sounds weird. So they just prefer Mary, the mother of Christ, who is God, or Jesus, who is God, but they believe she's the mother of God. And in English, they believe they say there's nothing really wrong with mother of God in English. Um, it just doesn't work in Aramaic. Uh, we have the Oriental Orthodox, which includes like the Coptics and the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox. Millions upon millions of them have split away from Rome in the 400s. Fully affirm the intercessory prayers of the saints and the, uh, the, the saints, the angels, and the Blessed Mother as the new Eve, everything we've said here so far. The Eastern Orthodox, of course, another huge number of them. The Anglicans, you will find some really weird uh, liberal Anglicans these days who've dropped all this stuff, but if you look into the Westminster documents, heck, our, our one of our Red Pope Religion team members, Andrew Stratelicis, is a high church Anglican, and he affirms everything we're saying here. And there are other Protestant branches too, who affirm much of it or most of it, or at least call it an optional belief, like the Methodists. And uh, there are a number of evangelicals who've been rediscovering things like the Virgin Mary. So why don't we now turn to this? I mean, I'm gonna say, if you're still a doubter on the Virgin Mary, that's fine. But from my perspective, when a majority of Christians have believed something, have been allowed to fall into error for 2000 years. That's if you say the majority of Christians have been allowed to fall into gross error and idolatry and pagan worship of a goddess for 2000 years, um, the burden of proof's on you. And the burden of proof is on you is to prove why your doctrines are correct. Show me in the Bible where we're not allowed to ask for intercessory prayers. Show me in the Bible where she was not ever, ever virgin. Show me in the Bible why she is no special place in heaven at all. Show me in the Bible while she, where she has none of that. Because we got the stuff in the Bible that says all that's true, and we got the external sources that says all that's true. So this this should be an education for non Christians too. A sign for you that you are in a fairly modern Christian group is that they deny the role of the Mother of God, the Virgin Mary. They will be uh, the, probably a very American sect, and uh, they will be in the major minority of Christians. They will speak as if they were they are the true Christians. I grew up among these people. They speak as if they're the true Christians. They're actually the minority. Okay, what the majority of Christians believe is what we're going to talk about. So blah 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 blah. Here's the deal. I think we just did a show on this last week, and I have some cool links I've lined up. But the understanding for uh, from the beginning, as we understand it, is that as uh, as Jesus was hanging from the cross, one of his last actions is he said, "Behold your mother," to the apostle John. 
who is the apostle to the world, and behold your son to her. Um, and this is traditionally for thousands of years by most Christians meant to mean truly she was giving, he was giving Mary to all Christians to be their mother. And so this is why she's called the Blessed Mother. It's not she's necessarily blessed because she became a mother, although, of course, that's a blessing. She's the Blessed Mother because she's the, considered to be the new Eve. Jesus is the new Adam. Mary is the new Eve. And she's the Blessed Mother of us all, at least if you'll have her. Is that making sense so far, John? I guess there's not much it makes to add sense. to that. It makes sense to me because I, of course, am a faithful Catholic. I mean, to, to me, it doesn't seem to be – since I was not uh, – I was raised Lutheran, but I stopped uh, at about age seven. So I was never exposed to this weird and unchristian hatred. I have seen some few, uh, you know, uh, denominations – uh, deliberate. I've seen some actual yeah. hatred for Mary out of some of them, but I, I'd say that's a minority. They mostly but it's, just look but at it's us rare. Like but it's yeah. rare. But it's, it's it's something I never came across until after I, uh, you know, converted. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I, I myself have no preconceptions. I was not raised in a tradition that said, uh, you know, the uh, the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon and and they're idolaters and and they they make statues and stained glass windows and those things are things of the devil. Since I, I was a complete atheist, I thought everyone was wrong. Okay, so so for me to to say this this is the uh, this is the lady that's spoken of in Revelation who shines like the sun and has the moon under her feet, uh, or to say that she was an eternal virgin, that doesn't that doesn't contradict anything I was raised to believe otherwise. Though it does for many of my Protestant friends, but since they were born and raised, to, to, I always taught, oh, she had other children after after Mary, uh, after excuse me, after Jesus, he was only he was only her first. Uh, that's not something that's not a, that's not something i had to to overcome so i never had to go through the arguments for and against i mean i could go through them now that now that i've heard them but they're not uh nothing you're saying seems to me to be extraordinary is what i'm trying to say C coming coming from the direction of where i come from i genuinely believe it comes from the fact that america was founded mostly by protestants although there have been catholics here from the very beginning including some who were here like 100 years and more before the United States was a country. Maryland, <laughs> Maryland is right next door to me, and I used to live in Maryland. And yes, it was Catholic since the the get go. And at least one of the founders was was him was Catholic and from Maryland. Sure. Um, the and and as the country expanded very shortly, when it got into the Louisiana territories and the Texas territories, and especially the California territories, the United States started picking up large Catholic populations, many of which are still there. And in yeah. fact, we've had native French-speaking and Spanish-speaking Catholics in the United States since longer than there's been in the United States. Correct. Um, and that's just, you know, and English-speaking, too, I just mean. So, yeah, I get a little tired. Like, I will call out Vox Day, who's claimed that Catholicism is an un-American religion. That's, uh, only to, to, that's only an attitude for those who came in during a certain era of America as Protestants. Uh, I, I like Mr. some of Mr. Day's work, and he's brilliant. But he, the anti-Catholicism, and and him, and Owen, and and some others on the what they call the alt right, have this whole kick of basically calling Catholicism more or less paganism, saying that prayers, intercessory prayers, are are pagan and wrong. They don't back these doctrines up except by personal readings of the Bible, but. People who talk like that, who talk about preserving Western civilization <laughs> and, and talk like that while, while talking about fighting off the Muslim aggressors are not being fair or honest to the history and not very Christian. Well, let, let me point out one thing to all my beloved Protestant brethren. There is not a single Protestant crusader. Nope, not a single one. All, 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 all Mary loving Catholics swirling down the Richard community. the Lionheart was a Catholic. England was Catholic at that time. Yep. Um, what, so, so we're the only guys who actually have, you know, legitimate historical expertise in how to fight the uh, how to fight off the pay and M. So yeah. don't talk to me about preserving Western civilization. We're we're the guys. We are Western civilization. The faith I is Europe. Europe is the faith. I genuinely believe the actual pagan approach is the Bible-only approach. 
that the Bible has everything. The Bible is, is literally sufficient for absolutely everything. The Bible completely explains itself and is self-contained. Um, that is a pagan belief. It is a pagan belief like the belief that the Muslims have in their Quran, that it's basically yeah. a magic book. And, yep. that if, and, and, and I think that even drives the incessant, you know, looks through ancient, uh, tra you know, ancient manuscripts trying to discover the more authentic, you know, whether the Mesa or the, you know, the, 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 the Septuagint or the Vulgate or what, just fighting over these ancient scraps of text to find the quote unquote most accurate version. It's all it, magic book theology. It is an idolatry because from a Catholic point of view, the church is the source of knowledge. Some of which the church wrote down became our holy book. Other parts were not written down because we're still alive. We're still in business. Well, and we didn't have to write everything down. Well, and the, the, yeah. when the, and it's interesting to note that when the Mohammedans broke away from the, from the church, because Mohammed was copying, there was no Protestants from to copy at that time. This was the, this was the, the, the seventh century. He was copying certain ideas from the Jews and certain ideas from the Catholics. And he wanted to make his own version of the Bible. And he wanted, it, and it, it, the Quran makes references to things in the Bible. The story of Adam and Eve is in there. The story of Cain and Abel is in there. They're they're slanted. They're different because they're they're now supporting a certain a different worldview. Uh, and the Virgin Mary is in there, and so is the Virgin Birth of Christ. Though he is Isa, as they call him, is regarded as being merely one prophet among many, a man and not a god. But, but even they uh, affirm the Virgin Birth at least. It's. But, but they affirm the virgin birth and they tell the story of the archangel Gabriel, Jibril as they call him, visiting her and saying, God will overshadow you and produce the prophet, and produce the prophet Jesus. Now, the interesting thing about this is there's been a lot of conversions recently of Muslims who have seen visions of the Virgin Mary coming to visit them. Yeah, and let's talk about a few of those. I've given links in the in the low bar to various sources. And by the way, I made sure to include non-Catholic. Uh, apparitions of the Virgin Mary, because I've heard some Eastern Orthodox who have an anti-Catholic attitude. And by the way, I'm sorry for that. I know there are some Catholics who are rude to Eastern Orthodox and vice versa. I can only say I love my Eastern Orthodox brothers very much. And on the uh, Red Pill uh, team, we have many Eastern Orthodox friends. Every, every Eastern Orthodox guy I have met has just been a gem. And I think of them as like two halves of the brain. I think, I myself think the two, the two halves of the severed church have to get back together. And we probably and, will um, during the second coming. We're probably not. Well, we're not going to arrange that tonight. And, and oh no, no, no! I'm not saying. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not hoping. I'm uh, not hoping um, the second coming is coming tonight. But I do. Here's, think it'll, here it'll on the Orthodox. The yeah, here on the Orthodox Wiki is one of the best known uh, apparitions of the Mother of God, to be, which appeared at uh, at Block Carnet Laherna in the 10th century of Saint Andrew of Constantinople. They encountered her. She knelt at a prayer. Um, they were threatened by an invasion. The city was spared blood and chest, uh, bloodshed because of her apparition. It's the feast of the uh, of, of I believe it's also known as the feast of the Virgin Sacrament. They commemorated every October first, and that's an apparition, a literal appearance. Uh, at Mount Athos, which is probably maybe one of the great jewels of the Eastern Church's crown, Mount Athos. It is a place I would very much love to visit, and and, and a, fr a friend I used to know actually got to visit there and had a personal encounter with the Virgin there because the story. Have you heard the story of Mount Athos, John? I'll tell it a little bit, then we'll get back to. Get I have not heard the story of Mount Athos. I'm familiar with Athos only as a character from the Three Musketeers, who is also, by the way, a character in the book I'm writing now. Just a plug for my latest book. Um, okay, basically, this is all also also for the Knox Wiki. Mount Athos has been there since 963 traditionally and has lasted through crusades and wars and world wars. And the short story of Mount Athos is that uh, the Virgin Mary specifically <laughs> asked God, her son, for Mount Athos for herself. And a group of monks has been there since, of Eastern Orthodox monks has been there since before the schism, 963. They will occasionally allow Catholic visitors. Um, and uh, no women are allowed on the island, including female animals. No female animals are allowed on the island, uh, allegedly by the Virgin's instructions. Uh, well, I, will, I will take away the word, word, word allegedly. I'm sorry, this, 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 I mean, like for more than a thousand years, not a female thing has been allowed on the island. Allegedly, because the mother wants it that way, she wants the voice for herself here in this little special place for herself. And 
the number of encounters with her in some form or another report on that island are simply off the chart. And it, it's, it's a storied island there uh, among uh, in, in Macedon, in northern Greece. And it's simply part of, well, I mean, I guess you could call it part of the Eastern heritage, but I mean, this is pre-schism stuff. And it's still there. If you're lucky, you can get to go visit. But if you're Catholic, there's a waiting list. And if you're Catholic, it's longer. Um, so there. This stuff is not just Catholic. I've had some Eastern Orthodox carp and say, you Catholics, you're too into Mary. Yeah, well, you've had your own Marian apparitions, my Eastern brothers, quite a few of them, and some very important ones, too. So um, let's talk now. Let's go back to let's go back to my favorite. I've got an article on this. The Battle of Lepanto. The Battle of Lepanto, or no, wait a minute. The Gates of Vienna is even better. The Battle of Vienna and the Holy Name of Mary. Let's start on this one, because this one involves the Virgin Mary in multiple ways. And, you know, anti-Marians who call Catholics pagans, who then talk about saving Western civilization, lives on up. Because you guys, you talk about the great battle at the at victory at the Battle of Vienna. Do you, why, do you not know the victory was given to the Virgin Mary explicitly? Because it was. She was credited with the victory specifically at the at the Battle of, Le, of, of Vienna. Do you, do you know, I'll, I'll go into all the reasons why, but it starts with something called Our Lady of Chestahova, which there's a number of articles you can read about Our Lady of Chestahova. This is an icon of, 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 the, bless, of the Mother of God and Jesus, a, a typical Madonna uh, icon. Although if you look at it very carefully, it's, it's actually quite atypical. Uh, it is not perfect to uh, standard Eastern or Western iconography because it's older than most icons and older than most of these sorts of things. Um, and tradition holds, you know, secular sources cast doubt on it and try and date it to like the year 1000, but secular sources are ideological. Church sources, including Eastern sources, date this thing to the first century and credit the artist as being St. Luke. So it's wow. a very, yes. And let me actually just see if I can get a better image um, of, of, let's just see if Wikimedia Commons has something. <laughs> I got I to gotta interrupt and say, one of the things I like about being Catholic is that I'm always stumbling upon something else from, from the good old days that I had no idea, you know, I know there was a version that Luke made that, that icon. Uh, ah. And the other denominations that are only like between 100 and 400 years old don't just don't have that uh, uh, richness to them. I mean, I'm not saying once again. No, I, I mean no insult to my to my Protestant brethren, but but they, uh, it's an added benefit. It's like it's like having all seven sacraments. It's just an added benefit to the other graces God showers on His, his beloved people. Yeah, here, here, and I mean us all. I don't mean just. I don't mean to. I don't mean we're beloved, and you guys are heretics. You are, but he's here's a, here. Here's a here's a look, look at it, and there, you know, it, it it shares many of the features of iconography, but I guess you could basically say it's less developed than than Eastern Orthodox or Catholic uh, iconography had been. It is very large. It is carved out of wood. Uh, you see scratch marks in that. I'll tell you the story of the scratch marks in a little bit. But the basic story is, um, you know, the pious legend is that it goes back to St. Luke and that he himself made it and that, that the mother was actually there to pose for it. We can't, you know, say that that's absolutely true, but the legend goes back, you know. But we, he, can't say, we can't say it's, it's not either because Luke clearly spoke to Mary before he wrote his gospel because he's got things in there that, that only she knew, like what was going on in her heart at the time, you know. Oh, there's, yeah. no other, there's no other witnesses to the wording of the Canticle of Mary, <laughs> except for her and Elizabeth, you know. Uh, but, yeah, exactly. And so uh, I'm trying to get another better image of this thing, uh, just to see if I can, uh, I can find a better image. But, okay, so this image, I apologize, everybody. I'm a little, I'm a little... Uh, discombobulated, just trying to find a better image of this thing. Um, but she she used to be in Constantinople. This icon used to be uh, within the Hagia Sophia itself. And uh, it's not clear to me exactly what happened, but during 
uh, sometime before uh, the fall of Constantinople, they actually lost this painting. It, it had actually, I'm sorry, this icon, it's not a painting, it's, 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 it's carving. Um, this icon, they had lost it. It had actually saved the city a few times, including them marching it around Constantinople a few times just to fight off enemies, which by the way, one of the things all Christians have believed for most of 2000 years is that Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant and that no army that um, ever marched with the Ark of the Covenant ever lost. That's in the Bible. And Christian tradition is no army riding under Mary's banner has ever lost anyway, either. This thing protected Constantinople more than once. Constantinople lost it, and within a half a century, Constantinople was in, under Muslim rule. One way or the other, it left Eastern Orthodox hands and came to Catholic hands and, and, and landed in Czestochowa, Poland. Uh, when, the, when the battle of, uh, when, the, when Vienna was under assault by Muslim forces there in Europe, uh, King Jan Sobieski got word that he was being requested to just come save their asses. There was literally no good reason like economically or militarily for King Jan Sobieski to do this. I mean, yes, sir, sure, some self-interest, but I mean, really, it's not like he was tight with Vienna or very close to Vienna either. Um, but he got word, and King Jan Sobieski of Poland literally ordered all the monasteries and churches in Poland to begin praying the rosary and to just not stop until he got home. He marched his, he, he detoured his entire army to Czestochowa, which was a few hundred miles out of the way, just to go there to ask for Our Lady's blessing and protection in the battle. He ordered his troops praying that rosary the entire way there. And it's generally agreed that the delay he, he, he faced because he went to Chestahova is why they arrived the very moment at the top of a hill when the Muslims were retreating and going back up it. And riding under her banner with rosary praying, rosary carrying soldiers, they completely routed the Muslim forces. The Battle of Vienna was won by Our Lady. By the way, they marched all the way home barefoot to say thank you, and they hold a, th they hold a parade every year in Poland with men marching down the streets barefoot, uh, carrying images of Our Lady of Czestochowa, because it's that important to Polish history. Allow me to suggest that if anyone is going to save Western civilization, it's probably going to be Poland, because they're the ones who stood up to the Soviet Union they're the ones who still don't allow. Uh, I believe abortion is still illegal in their country, or, or just, or is that has that changed lately? The Irish, unfortunately, have caved. But oh uh, no, the Poland, Poland, is, Poland is hard ass Catholic man. They don't, they don't, they don't play with any of that. Yeah, I, I don't think, yeah. I don't think, I, I don't know what exactly their their abortion laws are, but I'm pretty sure it's basically what a Catholic abortion law looks like, which is basically, you don't do it unless there's a really uh, life-threatening yeah. circumstance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it, it's the only reason. Um, and the, the interesting, one of the interesting tales of this, this icon of Our Lady is that you see the scratch marks on there. Uh, she was attacked by a, 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 an enemy soldier uh, uh, who tried to wound it and it paralyzed him and he died. So she's got that mark from an enemy sword. Um, but she killed him. <laughs> <laughs> and also, there is a guy in the Old Testament who, when he's trying to adjust the Ark of the Covenant after it's about to fall into a mud puddle, also is struck down. It seems a little harsh, but if you invite the glory of God to you, you better be sure your, your house is in order and your ducks in a row, because otherwise it's going to be too much for you. you know, so, even, yeah. the, even the pagans knew about that. Similarly, when she asked to look upon the undisguised form of Zeus, it was basically signing her own death warrant. You have to be you have to be pretty clean and pretty pure for to have pure divine energy going through you. That's another reason why, by the way, we we hold that Our Lady was was immaculately conceived. And if you look in the story of the Battle of Lepanto, which was the other time Christian forces were victorious against the Muslim foe invading Europe, guess what? They were not just Catholics. They were praying the rosary, and they were flying under Our Lady's banner. Once again, Mary has been believed not just by Catholics, but by most Christians for 2,000 years to be the new Ark of the Covenant, and that when you, when you fly under her banner, 
at least if she's really giving you your her blessing, uh, you will simply be victorious because flying under her banner is like carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. And I would like to propose a something like Pascal's wager to my fellow Christians and even a few Muslims who believe in preserving Western civilization against the the modern attack, that even if you don't believe Mary is everything we say she is, isn't it worth it just to give this a try in our upcoming fight against the forces that are gathering to destroy the West? Because I don't think at this point there's any doubt that there are such forces or that they are gathering. Uh, they seem to be really out in the open these days. Uh, and if you, you know, you're a Bible-believing Christian, why don't you turn to some of the older Christian tried and true things that that worked, that history shows, you know. Is the it, thing is, is to these traditions, while they're not as, as uh, like, you're not utterly required to believe them, they don't have the weight of Holy Scripture because nothing does, um, but if you read them properly, man, you read through the Old Testament, which I have the privilege of doing with my son now. We're, we're reading the entire thing together. We've made it, and it's the Catholic Bible, so it's longer, right? But we've made it all the way to Proverbs and the Psalms, and we've read everything up to then. Man, I'm sorry. You see apparitions of people who are dead appearing to give messages all the time in the Old Testament. You see miracles uh, being ascribed to uh, you know, even to just like relics, like like the bones of Elisha resurrected somebody who just touched them. Very much like somebody who touched Peter's uh, tools and aprons and stuff got healed. Um, things like this have not stopped. The Bible didn't say things like that would stop. I mean, yeah. you know, that we the, the define the most important revelation was all we would get, but not that we'd get no other revelations, no other guidance, and that there would be no, you know. That's what's so wrong with hermetically sealed Bible Christianity. Like nothing has really happened in the last 2,000 years that's, that's like what's in the Bible much, apparently. So apparently we no longer have people in heaven showing up to talk to people, even though yeah. that happened in the Old Testament days and I'm, in the New Testament. I am uh, always fond of pointing out to my modern secular friends that if you read the histories of any history book written before, let's say, 1700, they will routinely report the supernatural events along with the natural events <laughs> in their in their record of history. And the only reason why the supernatural events have been left out since about the time of World War One, I, I think the Angel of Mons might be the last time anyone seriously reported a supernatural event in a history book as if it really happened. It's just it's just a a, a matter of fashion. It's not like science proved there's no ghosts and there's no visitations. Science never. No, not, and has no, no ability to prove any such thing. It, it just people, people simply stop writing it down. But you can still find plenty of evidence. I mean, go into a Christian science bookstore and you can just read page after page after page of testimonies, all of them require two or three witnesses uh, of miracle healings that they've been doing routinely for the past hundred years. These guys don't even bother going to doctors. Look at what they save on doctor bills. Look at, look at uh, St. Thomas uh, uh, it's not believe that. Look at uh, Saint Augustine. Augustine mentions in City of God people whose like eyes were <laughs> dripping out of his head onto his cheek that by a miracle was cured. So the miracles in the in the in the Book of Acts were still going on by at least the, you know, the fourth and fifth century. You know the miracle healings at Lourdes are, are going on to this day. I, I, the I, the people who believe in God but think the miracles all suddenly stopped. When you know when Constantine uh, took over or whatever, uh, it, it, it it's it's not borne out by anything but their own. But it's not borne out by the evidence. Well, and within their own tradition, they'll often have stories of faith healings and and and, and miracles and visions that occur to people. I sure. you know I, I've heard Bible Christians say, have, you know tell me of their visions uh, of encountering Christ or encountering others. And I'm he like, what well, we're supposed to do is just say, well, you're delusional. That didn't happen because you ain't Catholic saying so you're a real Christian. I mean, what? But if, you're, but if you're a Christian at all, you believe a man came back from the dead. That's the definition of being a Christian. Otherwise, you're, you're a Jew or a Muslim, basically, you know. So yeah. if you think Christ is alive, then he could walk through your door tomorrow. By the way, we are talking a lot about Marian apparitions here, but apparitions of Christ have been, uh, you know, affirmed in a number of cases too. I wear a scapular, a, a red scapular, which is a rarer type, 
and that is associated with a with an affirmed uh, apparition of the Lord Himself. Um, uh, so I mean, it's not like we're saying this is the only kind of apparition that happens. Other people who've died have appeared too. Uh, uh, angels have appeared. Yeah. And and we have you know, we we have every reason to think that such things are actually more common than people realize because the church will only affirm. Uh, a, a major yeah, apparition really. with a lot of evidence and a the lot of time. Usually... Give... Here, here, let me say something about that because I thought this was hilarious because I, I found this out when I first converted. If you look at the miracles of Lourdes, there are two people, two groups who study every miracle that they can get their hands on that happens at the faith healing at Lourdes. One is the ch church, which then decides whether or not it's legitimate or not legitimate, whether it's a real miracle or not. And one is a board of medical examiners who decide whether or not the thing is ex explainable medically. And guess what? The medical examiners have a lot more items in the cannot be explained through science category than the church affirms is actually supernatural. Right, because the church does not affirm something except to the right. highest standards. And usually they want to wait years, right. too. They, they usually want to wait. They'll even want to wait decades if they can just to see what dirt may right. come up that they missed in a rush of excitement. So even if they're all like, exactly. yeah, we're pretty sure, we're pretty sure, yeah, well, let's give this another 10 years and, now, and we'll I, see. I'm old enough to remember when scientists who are supposed to be objective and skeptical uh, as a body, as a consensus, changed their mind as to whether there was a, an ice age coming in the next 50 years or, oh, yeah. a, or a global warming coming in the next 50 years, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and... They changed their mind in 1912 about Einstein, and they changed their mind a little bit earlier in the uh, uh, in earlier centuries about Newton. And I noticed that the 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 Vatican is very slow to affirm something to be an official doctrine, an official miracle, an official you know so on and so forth. Or even to this day, even to this day, they will not say the Shroud of Turin is supernatural. They won't say it's not. They'll say if you want to revere it, it's a, it's a perfectly legitimate. Uh, uh, a reverential object, but being the being the church, they're not gonna they're not going to rush into a decision. They will, wait not, they will not officially say that the yeah to this day they will not officially say the trial they know the trial of Turin is real. But they're the they're the Vatican. They're still they're still in their youth. I mean, why not why not wait till the year four thousand AD before they make a decision? Well, that's it's right. Gonna, I mean, it's still gonna be it's still gonna be around. What makes you think this is not the early days of the church? Yeah, I love that question. Uh, just to riff on that too, I mean, there's people who are convinced we're in the end times, and and including a lot of Catholics who think that. You go read, listen to Trad Cat Knight and some of his, and he's got all these pro I, prophecies from various. Let me just finish, John. He's got okay, all these okay. prophecies from various saints and all that. And the only thing I will say to that is, I keep an eye on it because I'm mildly interested. But for two thousand years, solid now. There have been people utterly convinced that we were in the end times right now, and so far their their batting average is point zero zero zero. So it might be we're in the end times right now, or it might be you know we could, we're free to contemplate what the year what the church will look like in the year thirty thousand. Well, I can all I can say is that since you or I or anyone listening might get run over by a streetcar tomorrow, you might be in your end times, whether or not the world is going to uh, see the rise of the antichrist or not. The uh, spirit of the antichrist is obviously here. And the alive great, at all the great red dragon, for all I for all I know, is, is communism. In fact, read your Bible correctly, and it says there's that numerous antichrists and running around. Yep. And they say right now, and that was written, you know, two thousand years ago. And he said right now, um, yep. and I assume that just means right now, pretty much always that there's antichrist spirits around. Mm -hmm. uh, since I've run into them and seen them, I'm I, I know they're real. Um, whether there is the antichrist running around, couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you, maybe, um, but only an idiot thinks he knows, or or, yeah. or sets his life around thinking he knows. Because the other thing the good book says is that neither the uh, sun nor the angels nor anyone knows when the end times are going to come. You it's know, the yeah, one thing you know, that's, that Christ specifically says he himself does not know, even though he's divine, <laughs> even though he's God. <laughs> so if he doesn't know, he you don't know. Man doesn't okay. know. Uh, well, but. But no, no, no. Here, watch me be a Bible Christian. John, you just don't understand. It says nobody knows the day or the hour. Didn't say nothing about the week, the month, or the year. We're going to figure this out. I got a new code. I've cracked the book of Revelations. And Excellent. Daniel, on, let me tell you all about it. I've got well, it down, son. I, I, will, I will continue the argument to, to the Bible Christian because it also <laughs> says that you'll notice when, this, when the signs of the times are coming. 
you'll see when it's getting worse. You'll see when, when things are getting worse. And we're in a bad period right now. We're we're in an end time smelling period right now. Oh yeah. But don't get me wrong. I, I I think the Antichrist is more open and more powerful and more noticeable now than he's ever been. But I also think that the woman clothed in the sun, with the seven with the twelve stars in her hand, which is uh, Mary, which is Mary, is going to lead the next. Uh, is going to lead her children in in victory against it. And, and by the, war, the way, warfare is going to be spiritual, not not physical. When you read that part about about uh, uh, in Revelations about uh, the woman clothed with the sun at her feet, the moon on her head, a crown of twelve stars. Later on, it shows her in birth pangs. Yeah. Which, but that has been traditionally interpreted as the pangs of giving birth to the rest of us as the new Eve. <laughs> that it's us that's causing her that pain. Um, you know, however you want to read it. You know what? There's Christians who have their other interpretations. Fine. That's your opinion. We'll stick with the ones that so many Christians have believed. Now, there's another factor with with my personal belief, no. and that is I also had a vision of Mary. That's that's the reason why I converted. There you go. So to me, it not only does it not seem unrealistic, I would have to really strain my brain to say, "Oh, I saw her, but you know, you didn't. I, I saw her, but Bernadette did not. I saw her, but the three shepherd children at at." It uh uh uh, uh Panama. Guadalupe did oh, not. Guadalupe. Okay. Um yeah. you know, let me um, let me make a point. All right. I mean I I am actually always itchingly curious when somebody says he's had an encounter of our mother. Um you know, because I've had my own and I, I've actually had several, um, although they're hard to talk about. Um but the th things like that, these are what if anybody wants to know, this is what Catholics call private revelations. Um, which means that, A, nobody's obliged to believe them. No. Even, even those of us who had them are, are free to doubt them. And say, oh, you know, maybe I, you know, whatever I have. <laughs> maybe you're a bit of beef. Maybe there's more of gravy than of grave for you, sir. Yeah, we, we can do that too, along we with can. the Ebenezer. <laughs> <laughs> look, at, look at how that turned out. I eventually figured out that you could skeptic away a lot of your own spiritual experiences and that I had done that a few times in the past. Buddy, uh, you can skeptic away your own self-identity. I know people who think they are robots. They freely decided that they can't make decisions. So, yeah, yeah, you can do that. Sure. I, uh, and so that's called a private revelation. Nobody's required to believe them. You know, I'm not required to believe John's story. He's not required to believe mine. Nope. We're not even really required to believe a church-approved apparition. But generally speaking, when, when you have a church-approved apparition, it really means there's a lot of evidence and yeah. that a lot of people have tried to knock it down before the fine church will finally say, yeah, we think this thing's real. So, for example, I, I got a list of nine approved apparitions from the Catholics. Uh, and I do, you know, I, I don't even know the story of all of these. But, they're, you know, nine, they're, uh, they're, they're the biggest and best known. Our Lady of Guadalupe, which we talked about last week, uh, the apparitions of Rudebach, France, I don't know what that was. La Salette, La, La, the apparition at La Salette, I know something about it. Lourdes, definitely, I, you know. Yeah. But all of these, Fatima and all of them, are extraordinarily well attested. Let me say something as a... And by the as, way, as I've attorney. noticed professional... Let me, say something, let me interrupt and say something as an attorney. Okay. If you look at the number of people who, who believe that uh, President Lincoln was shot by an actor in Ford's Theater... Uh, the legal evidence, the admissible legal evidence for that fact is less than the admissible legal evidence for the miracle of the dancing sun. Because more people saw that, and that happened more recently. That happened in like 1910, right? Right, right. And there were, and there were, there were multiple simultaneous contemporaneous accounts of it. Whereas Ford Theater only holds, I believe, like 300 or 400 people. So it's uh, so there's almost ten times the number of eyes of witnesses, and it happened closer to the uh, closer to the uh, the event. Yeah. So well, if you're going to look at what a, if you're going to look at the kind of thing a jury looks at to see how reliable the evidence is, the number of witnesses and how and how fresh the evidence is, then you're you're, you're uh, you can disbelieve in the Dancing Sun if you want, but then why do you believe in Caesar? Why do you believe that Lincoln was shot? We have, we have, we, do, we have to close because believe it or not, once again, whenever I, I talk about Mary, time just flies. We need to wrap it up. We're actually running a little over already, but this happens every time I talk about Our Lady. Uh, she means a lot to me, and she brought me, me to me Christ. Too. She brought me to Christ straight up. 
she did she dragged me through the mug of christ that's my testimony i will i will give this as a brief description again this is something that you know rachel fulton brown and others we've talked about and she's the one who pointed out this out to me it's so true there's christians who will say they affirm the trinity but they have no idea what it means i've had them even liberally say things i believe in the trinity but i don't understand it so i can't say anything and that just is a lack of understanding of the trinity as it developed and the development of trinitarian doctrine and the development of the doc of the understandings of the mother of god parallel each other because she's actually a key to Marian to, to Trinitarianism. Once you understand this, you know, uh, this is going to be a bro brief one because we need to get it going, but this is Old Testament stuff. Under Jewish law, a, a, a king's queen under, in, the, in the line of David, a king's queen is always his mother. This is why Mary is the queen of heaven. He's the king. Um, a king in the line of David, his queen was always his mother. Therefore, that she's his queen. She's alive in heaven. And, you know, he loved her like a mother. And if you think he doesn't still love her like a mother, you're, you're, you're just an idiot. Okay? He would love her infinitely like a son, like a husband, like a father. And, you know, he loved her as a child, as her, his mother. Um, she's somebody special in heaven. No, she's not all-powerful. All-powerful is through him. Um, but we have a spiritual connection with her. Um, we can ask for a spiritual connection with her. He gave us to be our mother too. He gave us to her. He gave her to us to be our mom too, making him our brother. This is how you start to understand what the Trinity is. This relationship, she is the daughter of the Father. She is the spouse of the Holy Spirit who impregnated her. She is the daughter of, she is the mother of the Son. God lives, loves her infinitely in all those capacities and made her his mother and made her his queen. She, therefore, is somebody really special. And this is, this is all doctrine that's not just Catholic. Everything I just said is why most of these other Christians too. They'll affirm it directly or they'll at least accept it as acceptable yeah. belief. And it should be noticed that all the older churches, all the churches that are over a thousand years old, all affirm this, which means that the yeah. only churches who deny it are the ones, are the new kids on the block. And the they're ones, the ones who are introducing the doctrines of men. To yes, I'm afraid they are. Or are they even thinking, well, I'll just go back to first century Christianity and reconstruct it. Well, well, I'm sorry. Where does the book even say you get to do that? And how are the decisions you're making really sensible? Yeah. You know, when we have the writings of people who were students of the apostles and, you know, who knew them. I, unless, unless you're performing miracles to show that you're a prophet, what, what authority do you have to speak for God anyway? And yes, apparitions of the Lord himself have happened. They're probably more common. Apparitions of other saints, including Old Testament figures, have been known to happen. There is no reason to dismiss them, and it is wrong and unchristian to call it necromancy. Necromancy is when you do spells to try to summon somebody. That's not okay. <laughs> it's, it's really it's, specifically, it's, it's consulting ghosts to read the future, which is the one thing that the Christians... Uh, of. And magic, is, magic is A-OK -okay if you're a Confucian or if you're a Hindu. It's the one thing the Christians say is wrong that other religions allow. I should, I should say Jews and Muslims too also forbid. And by the way, by the way, there is a standard Christian test that I will give to anybody who has a spiritual encounter. I it's biblical. I can't remember the citation, but it should also make perfect sense to you. It's from John. If you, if, you have, if you have an encounter with a spiritual creature and you're not sure whether it's a, a, an honest or a trickster, you literally ask it if it affirms the religion of Christ. If it affirms. No, no, no. no. You have to say, do you affirm that? that uh, Christ came in the flesh. Okay, you affirm that Christ came in the flesh. And if he says that Christ is Lord and came in the flesh, then you know he's a true spirit. Otherwise, he's a, he's a diabolical deceiver. And that's biblical. That's so biblical. We're that's, talking that's, about the is beloved, the yeah. beloved disciple himself, who knew a thing or two about visions, says that. Mm -hmm. John, but, I mean John. What a great name. I honestly believe that even if you don't become Catholic, if you're an evangelical, if you're even a Baptist and you're open-minded, or even a, a Calvinist, this is possible. John Calvin at least affirmed her perpetual virginity. If you're an evangelical Christian who at least learns to love the mother of God, you will bring greater unity among Christians. And even if you don't become Catholic, you'll be able to make much more Catholic friends by just being, and, and, and Eastern Orthodox friends and, and, and other friends you never knew 
because this is an ancient and valid Christian tradition. Those who say it's wrong should have to prove it, and they can't prove it biblically. They've just come up with their own doctrines that they're putting in because, you know, the scripture isn't plain enough for them. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I will recommend Scott Hahn's work again. I will also talk with anybody and anybody who wants to contact me wants more references. Um, I, I, I hope we can talk offline sometime about our Marian encounters, John, but maybe we should close it up. Got a final thought? I don't have any final thought. All I, all I got to say is that, that, there's two things that all that seem to accompany anything that's anti-Christian and anything that's that's heretical. One of them is hatred of Mary, and the other is hatred of the Jews. Whenever hatred of the Jews crops up, I know that I I, I can see the thumbprint of Satan in there. You know, <laughs> that's his work. He's always out to get them. And Mary is a Jewess, so you know it's it goes hand in hand. <laughs> well, speaking of which, tomorrow night we're going to have an interesting conversation with Misha Popoff about the more controversial works of uh, E. Michael Jones, who's been all the rage lately. So that should be fun. We got planned debates coming up with, uh, I believe, the Atheist Alliance. So we got stuff going on here every day. Every day. We'll be back here with John Wright next week. Maybe to talk more Mary stuff. I don't know. But I would case, not mind having a part two because it's a deeper topic than. You and I didn't even know start going through those uh, that list of uh, apparitions, and I, there's modern ones of, of her appearing above a mosque in in the Middle East that just happened just uh, two years ago or three years ago. Multiple yeah. prophecies say that Mary is the key to converting the Muslims. The, the dancing That's sun was seen in the dancing sun was seen in South America recently. All and right, people taped it on YouTube. We're gonna talk more Mary next week because uh, I, I actually believe this one that Mary is the key to converting the Muslims. Yeah, uh, and I hope cool. others airs that uh, other so-called defenders of Western civilization like Box Day eh, eh, um, actually come to terms with the fact that this isn't paganism. This is official Western Christianity. Yeah. And and I truly believe Western Europe cannot be saved without the help and the intervention and the blessings of the Virgin Mary, our mother. I truly believe that. And I'm not the only one who thinks it. So in any case, give us a like, give us a subscribe. Please tell your friends or enemies and God bless everybody.